Hi you guys, welcome back to my Monday chit chats. Hope you guys all had a really good weekend. I think today's video is gonna be a little bit shorter than my past podcast because I honestly didn't think that I would even have time or the energy to film this video. So I stopped recording and documenting my week and topics I wanna to talk about like on Wednesday last week. Um, but yeah, my week was really hectic. First of all, it was so gross in Paris. It, even today, it, this is like day 10 of straight gray skies and rain in Paris. On Saturday, we got maybe one hour of sunshine, but truly outside of that, it is just literally cloud coverage and rain all day, every day. And it actually reminded me of something that I wanted to talk about is that people always ask me like, when is a great time to come to Paris? When do you recommend coming to Paris? And I am just gonna reiterate my opinion on this because as a person who lives here, this season is just the worst. It brings out the worst in everybody. Everybody is like, has the worst seasonal depression. So what I want to say is that from I would say mid-February or early February all the way up until mid-April, it is just rain season in Paris. It is con like, this is year four that I lived here, okay? It is consistent. Every single year, early spring is just rain literally every day. I cannot stress that enough. I remember two years ago, I actually had a south-facing balcony and I had this whole garden on my balcony. I had 16 tomato plants. I had 10 basil plants. I was just miss green them and i was so pissed i was infuriated because mid-april we legitimately got 14 days straight without a single moment of sunshine it was just rain and gray skies every single day and you know what happened to my tomato plants all 16 of them died i was like so pissed so i'm really not exaggerating when i say that this time of year in paris is just awful and i'm like wow that's such an awful way to start this video i don't want to be negative because obviously coming to paris is going to be fun either way i think i'm a little bit jaded because i live here so i experience paris when it's the best and sunny and flowery and then i have the inverse where it's gray and rainy so i really prefer the sunny days so i mean either way if you go to paris you'll have a good time but i definitely recommend coming early spring <laughs> like april may because you'll be here for you know, the nicer sunny days, the flowers, everything in bloom, but without the heat waves and the massive amount of tourism that the summer months get. Um, so that's just my two cents. I'm definitely, like even today, I'm facing the gray sky and I just wanna put my pajamas on and go back to bed. It's awful. Um, let me get, let me get to my list. I don't have too many things to talk about. I loved your questions. Thank you again for submitting them, you guys. Um, as a reminder, you can follow me on Instagram and every single Saturday I'll put a little question box and you can send me any topics, comments, questions you have. But, oh my gosh, the very first thing on this list, I was like, this is such a big cultural difference that I have to talk about because I need to know if I'm the only one. So as you guys know, I recently joined a women's basketball team and for the past three years I have been playing on a men's basketball team and it's sort of like the only official team that i've ever joined it's a competitive team we have matches we have practices multiple times a week like it's very much like i don't know it's like a competitive team you would have when you're a kid going to practice three times a week and playing games on the weekends but because i was on the boys basketball team i was never really confronted with how people are in the change rooms. I know this, this sounds weird, but bear with me. I obviously didn't change with the rest of the team. And because you need a key to get in the change room and stuff, and I'm the only girl on the team, I didn't ever ask for the key. I just wore sweatpants and a sweater. And so like I would arrive at the gym with my shorts and top underneath sweatpants and a sweater. And when I would leave, I would just put the sweatpants on and the sweater get on the metro and have a shower when I get home. So I never even used the change rooms and I was never confronted with like behavior in a change room. 
And so now that I'm on this women's team and we practice multiple times a week, we have games, like the you go to the change room before and after. And um, the reason why it was so shocking to me is because in high school, like I grew up in Canada, I grew up in Toronto, in um, high school on any competitive sports teams, because I also played basketball when I was a kid in Canada, you never really like undressed fully, had showers, and like, I don't know, you, you always just sort of either quickly switched off your pants and your top and like, you know, you still kept on your underclothes and stuff. Um, but in France, it's the opposite. It's like very normal to, after you've had, you know, a sweaty practice, a sweaty game, to um, get completely undressed, go have a shower, like get out of your dirty clothes. And I just, I don't know why, but I like freeze in these moments. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, do I do this? Like, am I supposed to have a shower? Are people, cause I'm always the first one in the change room. Like to me, I'm just like, okay, sweatpants on and home we go for a shower. I don't really like the idea of showering in a public gym because especially then it means you have to bring a towel. You have to bring your own soap. You have to, um, I don't know. It just seems like a lot more of a hassle, but I totally get it. Like it's gross to feel dirty for the time where you might go for a drink after a game or even the time you spent on the metro going home. So I totally get it, but I really just felt so, and it's totally me, like the girls didn't make me feel uncomfortable or anything, but I just felt so awkward being like, oh, do I, do I go like participate in this, like everybody has a shower after i just i didn't know she and even now i'm like oh my gosh i don't know what to do and we'll have to see how it progresses but definitely oh i was culturally shocked and i don't know if it's a north american thing i don't know if it was my own community if it's a toronto thing but i swear you guys i have been on so many sports teams and no one has ever used the showers in the women's change room i know the guys like would shower and stuff, but I have never been on a women's team when I was a kid or a young adult. And like, I, I don't know this, I'm just like rambling at this point, but let me know your thoughts on this. I was just so culturally shocked and I don't know if it's just me or if it's just like actually a cultural difference from North America to France. Um, okay. Yeah. The second to last topic, again, I don't have many topics. I'm sorry, you guys, but, um, so I wanted to tell you guys, about this new project I'm doing. Be oh, I wanna share it because I'm obviously very excited about it, but I also wanna share it because I want your opinion. Um, and actually before I get into this project that I wanna share, uh, let me talk about my opinion first because I'm not gonna lie, another reason why I didn't even wanna film today is because I was kind of shocked by the comments that I got on my last video. There was a lot of people who were really grilling me for giving my opinion about Taylor Swift. Like there was just a lot of kind of mean comments being like, you would never give your opinion about a man. Uh, you would never give your opinion about other artists. Like she just gets so grilled all the time by everybody, leave her alone. And I just, want to say on this topic. Number one, I don't give my opinion on other musical artists because 90% of the music I consume is Taylor Swift. She's getting my time. She's getting my money. That's why I'm giving an opinion. I don't listen to male artists. That's why I don't give my opinion on them. It's not like a singling out kind of thing. It's that she occupies the majority of my listening time to music. Like that's why I'm I'm critical of her and not every other artist on this planet. And like people can say what they want about, um, you know, let her earn her money. She works so hard, da da da. Here's the thing, you guys, it's like, there's so many issues with it, but like it's deceptive to her fans. Uh, now I'm on a Taylor Swift thread. That's not, that's not at all where I want to be, but it is deceptive. I think of any artist, I'm sorry, I don't know any other artists that are putting out music right now, but I think it's deceptive to put out an album, have all of your fans purchase that album, one week later announce another version of that album where you can only get access to the full track list, like she put bonus tracks on that. So 
now you've asked your fans to buy one album and a second album and you didn't tell people that there were more versions coming like this is the thing you should be transparent with how many versions there are of something before you ask your fans to purchase every single one like i really think that's very deceptive because then what happened one week later the albatross version came out she has a third version and like I mean, I'm assuming it's going to continue up until the release date, but I just really think it's deceptive not to be upfront with your fans um, about what the different buying options are for the albums and to be so secretive about how many there are um, and to create this like, oh, there's limited quantities, you better buy it now. And I just think it's deceptive. That's my opinion. I also don't think it's great to ask people to buy 10 different albums, I think it's wasteful, but this is not a Taylor Swift rant. What I want to say on this topic is that in the same way, like I give my opinion on certain things and I, I won't give my opinion on other things in the future because honestly, it really hurt me the comments that I got on my last video, like it definitely hurt me. Um, so I, I don't want to give my opinion on other topics in the future, but the reason why I gave my opinion is because I am also a creator. I'm obviously a small, tiny droplet of a creator compared to Taylor Swift. But when I tell you that I genuinely, that genuinely value your opinion and your comments and your feedback and constructive criticism and your positive reactions to like, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful that you, number one, took the time to watch something that I made and then on top of it you leave me a comment or feedback or something positive like I'm so genuinely grateful for that and when I ask you to give your opinion it's because I like what I create is for you and so it's so important to me that it's helpful it's interesting like I don't really know how to explain it but I just I genuinely value your opinions on what I'm creating and I would assume that Taylor Swift or any artist for that matter no matter the size wants to hear the feedback from her fans and it's not just like I say feedback but like you know there's the positive comments there's feedback in general and then there's the constructive criticism that actually also allows you to take a step back and think if there's a comment again like i'm talking constructive criticism I, i'm not at all for like hate comments or anything like that but um when you give someone constructive criticism in a kind way uh you know it it really allows them to take a step back and think about their worldview, about how they're doing things and I don't know, no one is ever going to be perfect and almost everything can be like, well, everything is a learning experience, you know? So, you know, I, I don't think it's ever going to be a bad thing to give your opinion um, when someone asks for it or I don't know. <laughs> it's not like Taylor Swift is asking for opinions, but um, my main point here is as a creator, I genuinely value um, constructive feedback and um, comments from people who consume what I create and I just assume it's the same for artists that's how you improve that's how you grow that's how you learn like I don't know I just genuinely I thought it was kind of crazy that there were so many people shocked that I was giving my opinion on something and I like I I'm never going to be hateful towards something or um, you know nothing is mean-spirited everything i say is always going to be um I, i'm always going to try and be positive right like so yeah i don't know you guys <laughs> my my that that whole topic aside i genuinely want your opinion on this new project that i'm making um because i value it and so this whole project <laughs> i swear i spent the entire week last week working on it. i was up so late last night i was i literally worked monday to sunday non-stop and what i'm working on are a couple things right now i'm focused on making paris itineraries and i know that you can literally google and find free itineraries all over the internet for paris but my itineraries are a combination of um activities restaurants monuments 
places of interest that work well together on a 24 hour, 48 hour or a 72 hour route uh, that are targeted for the different types of tourists or travelers. You know, you're your first timers in Paris, you have maybe your second or third time and then you have people who come to Paris all the time and are looking for more of a local perspective. So I'm really trying to cater the itineraries to the different groups of people coming to Paris. And I'm not just giving an itinerary, it's also really important for me to both integrate the knowledge of the history of this place. Like if I'm recommending a museum, I'm gonna tell you in the itinerary why this museum is so important, what this building was before, give you, you know, information on the sites inside of the itinerary. I'm gonna include directions and streets that people should take. I'm saying I'm going to, I've already done them. <laughs> um, which streets to take for the most scenic route, which restaurants are amazing and genuinely authentic. Um, and also, I, I also have how to do things in French. So for example, if I'm recommending a restaurant on the itinerary, I'll leave instructions for how to make a reservation in that restaurant and I'll put them in English and then in French. So you can practice your French if you want to as well. So all that to say, I, I really have tried to build the most comprehensive itineraries possible and they're long, like <laughs> they really are long. The the 24 hour one I kind of just finalized and it's 15 pages. So it's like, it is heavy duty. And not just that, but I also had to build a website to put all these itineraries on because I like, they're gonna be put up for sale on my website. Uh, so it's just like learning new skills, being motivated by that, by this new project. I really found like I was, sort of slowing down in my motivation because you guys hear me talk about this all the time, but being on YouTube or social media in general feels kind of like a popularity contest where your self-worth is dependent on what other people think of you, what other people think of the content you're creating. And so if you have a video that doesn't do so well, for example, you feel so bad about yourself. And inversely, if you have a video that does well, you're like, wow, this is so great. But it's, it's demotivating to be stuck in that cycle of the highs and the lows of your social media performance. So I'm finding that having a new project that is something I'm obviously very passionate about. Like I, I put a significant amount of time in learning about the history of Paris, the architecture, um, you know, learning about what to do in Paris as well. So it's obviously something I'm passionate about. I'm very excited to be working on this project. Um, so yeah, I just genuinely would love to know what you guys think of that, what you look for in an itinerary, what would be, you know, useful for you. I haven't launched the website yet. There's a couple more, there's a couple finishing touches I have to make, but it should be launched, I wanna say in, oh, I'm hoping three weeks max. Um, I, I don't know, I, I feel like I feel like I might be a small creator, but I've been on YouTube, like at least the amount of videos I've posted, I really feel like I have a connection with you guys. And so when I have a project like this, like I'm just so excited to share with you. So I'm looking forward to posting or publishing the website. I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback and let me know down below what you guys think of that. Um, I think as well, when it comes to Paris, I, I also had to get a lot of opinions from my best friend, from my mom, from my grandma. And it's because I am a little bit blinded sometimes because I've lived here for so long. Things that are like first, first nature, second nature to me, um, I assume are, everyone knows, but then I'm like, no, when you first got to this city, it was hard to understand how to buy a Metro Pass and it was hard to, figure out how to buy a ticket for this. And so I am a little bit blind to those, to the challenges that are just natural for anyone who's like visiting Paris for the first or second time. So my ears are open, my eyes are on the comments. Let me know what you think. And yes, what I also wanted to say about this is I, a uh, part of this whole itinerary creation is that I'm testing, like I'm not gonna recommend anything that's not good. So. I'm obviously in the process of testing a lot of activities and restaurants. And there was this one restaurant in particular that um, an older gentleman on my 
basketball team had suggested to me. He was like, I love this restaurant. It's like so authentic. No tourists know about it. It's really good French food, really affordable and in a really good location. I was like, this is the exact kind of restaurant I want to recommend. And we had already got, he recommended this restaurant to me like a year ago. And we actually went there for Jean's birthday with all of our friends last year. And so before I put it on my itinerary, I wanted to go back and to make sure it was still of excellent quality. And it was, it was amazing. And I was talking with the, he's not the restaurant owner, but he, I guess is the restaurant manager. He's an older gentleman. And I wanted to know like how he would describe his restaurant, the type of cuisine. I wanted to know what kind of blurb I should put in beside that restaurant and what his favorite dish is, what their specialty is. Like I wanted to know all the details. And um, I don't really tell people that I'm going to review things because I don't want that to change the way I'm like treated or the food I receive or anything like that. But yeah, by the end of it, we start, I started telling him like, I started asking these questions and sort of explaining what I was doing. And so he goes back into like this little bookshelf in the restaurant and he brings this massive, massive book, like a coffee table book. And it's about really old, like historically important restaurants in Paris that still exist. And he was telling me about one in the 18th and he was like, you definitely need to go review this one. And um, it's obviously very important historically, but the food there is good. There's like a live um, pianist and entertainment and it's in the 18th. So it's a great location. And so yeah, I was like flipping through this book and everything. And then we go, we leave, we're ready to, sorry, we go, we pay, we're ready to leave. And he was telling me, oh, like you can leave your business card at the restaurant, no problem. Like totally would love to support you. And he asked me more about what I was doing. And I, I was like, oh, I'm creating these online itineraries and guides for people who come to Paris. And he was so skeptical. He shut me down. He was like, that will never work. That you're, you're doing it online? Never, that will never work. There's too much free stuff available. Like there's no way you could ever sell anything like an e-guide or an e-itinerary online. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, I am adding a lot of value into these like itineraries. They're packed with um, insider tips, ways to save money, special events, the history of things. Like, I don't know, I, I feel like they're pretty good. And he just like really insisted on the fact that I would fail. And I was like, wow, that is so mean. Like, who does that? Who, who spends an hour talking with you about like restaurants and who shows you their culture and brings out books for you to read? And then I was just like shocked that he shut me down in that way. And it definitely made me doubt myself for, I don't know, like a good 48 hours. I was like, wow, am, is this a bad idea? Like, is this not at all something that will be helpful to people? So that's also another reason why I'm asking for your opinion because, oh my gosh, he was like adamant that I would fail. So um, yeah, I just, I was like, I, I think it's also because he was older. He was like, if you're not, like you should be doing tours in person, you should give live tours. And I was like, well, I don't really want to do that. I kind of want to put all this information I have in these guides and share them with people. And the reason I don't, like initially I did want to do live tours, but I don't really want to do them anymore for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, like tours aren't accessible to everyone. They can be pricey. The groups are limited. Um, I would rather just create an affordable itinerary or guide for people and have it like be accessible to a wider amount of people. And on top of that, personally, as you guys I'm sure can guess, I hate crowds. I hate them. I really, downtown Paris, all of the museums, the monuments, the well-known spaces in Paris during the summer months, they are flooded with tourists. It's actually insane how many people arrive in this city in the summer. And it's not just the crowds, it's the pickpockets that come with it. It's like the heightened amount of security that you see going around. And it's just like, I, I, I don't know. It just, it, it, it makes me feel anxious. I'm not a person that likes crowds. It makes me feel incredibly anxious. So I don't see myself in the peak of tourist season, like July, August, um, being able to give tours every single day in a space that like makes me anxious to be in. And 
obviously, like I said, you're gonna have a good time in Paris no matter when you come and even if there's a lot of other people, a lot of other tourists, like it, you're gonna have a good time either way. And I definitely am not saying that you shouldn't go to the popular places and the good museums and the important sites. Like if you're coming to France and Paris, it's so important that you see those things. Like people love to like hate on the Eiffel Tower. And I'm like, no, it's such a cool experience walking up the Eiffel Tower, seeing the view, watching it sparkle at night. Like I, I have done it several times and I love it. So it's totally something that people should do. It's just, I would rather do that off season when there's way less people than um, during the summer. I am just like really ranting. I don't know what is up with me today, but um, yes, all that to say, <laughs> let me know your thoughts. I don't know if there's anything else on my list. Okay, I think that's it. I think those are all the topics that I really wanted to cover. Honestly, I'm not getting up to too much these past few weeks or days because like I said, the weather is just so bad. You, I, I just don't even want to leave my house. It's, you're going to be caught in a thunderstorm. We went out this weekend, like John and I just went out for a coffee. I wanted to go tour an area for an itinerary and like 30 minutes in, torrential downpour and we had an umbrella but we were still soaked like it just it is inescapable um so i haven't really gotten up to too much but let's get into your questions i'm so excited they're so good the first question we have is from fatima fatima thank you so much for sending in your questions i actually love all of them and this one in particular uh i actually asked it to john probably two days ago whenever i posted on instagram and we had a solid 50 minute discussion <laughs> about this question. So I'm prepared to answer. She says, if you can go anywhere in the world and money wasn't a problem, where would you go? So <laughs> if I could travel anywhere and money wasn't an issue, I think it would be to Scotland. Um, Jean and I want to go to Scotland this year. We really, really want to do the Highlands, but we were just looking at the cost of things and the amount of time that you need to really properly have a road trip through the highlands and it's just not in the budget for this year it's not just not in the budget but you also have to take i would say at least three weeks vacation to go on that kind of trip to really be able to see everything you want and so yeah it's just not feasible for either one of us this year but i really hope someday we can make it to the scottish highlands if i had to pick a place to live and money wasn't an issue i would probably pick an option where I have two residences. <laughs> I would love to have an apartment in the very center, the downtown hyper center of Paris. I love the Paris architecture. I, aside from the crowds, I really do like the, the vibe of Paris. The problem is though, the closer you get to the hyper center, the more obscenely unaffordable it is. Like I'm talking, if you want to live by the Louvre or even in the Fifth Alonis Mall, it's very expensive for a very tiny apartment, like very tiny. So that's what I'm saying. If money was an issue, I would get like a three bedroom penthouse apartment in the very downtown of Paris. I'm thinking about if you've ever been to Paris, um, the top of buildings will have these sort of dome these domes with windows that go all the way around. I'm like, wow, that is just a dream to be able to have a view of Paris, to be in the center of Paris, but have a reasonably sized apartment with like soundproof walls and high up. So you have the view. I would love that. But I, again, as you guys know, I'm not the, the, the biggest city girl. I love being in Paris when it's not tour season, but as soon as there's too many people, I just like get very overwhelmed. So I would also really love to have uh, like a country, a home in the countryside where I could have a couple animals, a really big garden, kind of like a homestead, I guess you could say. I, I'd love to have those two options. I really do, like I think about everything I want, everywhere I want to live in my mind, and there's just so many. I mean, I would love to live on a boat. I would love to live by the ocean. It's just, honestly, the list could go on and on. I would, there's so many places I wanna live, but as you get older and as you feel like you really wanna get settled, it's, I think, hard to experience all of them. So that's what I would pick. David says, what are your life goals? Thank you, David. It's so nice to hear from you. <laughs> um, 
My life goals. I would say I have a lot of them. I think one life goal that I think about all the time, sorry, <laughs> one life goal that I think about all the time is I want to be financially stable enough to open a type of shelter that would help people in all different facets of life. So I would want to open a place that would serve as like a homeless shelter, but not just a homeless shelter to also have like obviously, you know, a, a soup kitchen and also offer mental health help and offer professional help, you know, helping people who, who, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to uncross my legs. <laughs> my feet are falling asleep. Um, to help people who are struggling and, and I don't know. I, I just think that when I look at my life, I really feel like I am so privileged in so many ways. I have an amazing family that supports me in every, uh, every fast of life. I have an excellent, excellent, what a weird word. I have a, I have a loving partner and I just am surrounded by so many great people and not everybody has that. And so I would just like to open somewhat of a shelter that would help people who, you know, are less privileged than me to be successful because like the reason why I'm saying this is I'm like I don't just want to open a homeless shelter I want to open a place where it can help people you know reintegrate and feel successful and um, really get back on their feet and I was reading this no I think I was listening to a podcast that was talking about this study that was done on homelessness and I think it was in California I could be wrong but basically, uh, it was sort of like disproving this perception that people have of like, if you give people who are homeless money, they will spend it on drugs or alcohol. And actually, um, they gave this group of homeless people, I think it was 600 or $650. And the vast majority of those people with that money saved it over time to be able to rent something and then be able to um, reintegrate into the professional into the professional, into the workforce. And it was something they wanted to do, but they just didn't have the money to do that before. So the study really did show that if you give, if you help people, they're like, nobody just wants, not nobody, but the majority of people, at least in the study, didn't just want the free handout. They wanted the help to get back on their feet and then to contribute back into society. So, I mean, all that to say, I really would like to build something that is going to, give back to to communities give back to to help people and the reason why i say i want to be financially stable enough for this is because i i think it's such a struggle when you see um anything that's like um an ngo or a job that's like environmental anything or social anything they're typically like underpaid or they're less lucrative than like I don't know, more businessy roles. And I just wanna make sure that the people that I would hire for like the mental uh, health help or like the professional growth help or anything like that, that they would have, you know, a competitive salary and that it's not just like this, this place where people would, you know, have to take a cut in their salary to, you know, help make the, oh my God, I'm like really rambling, but that is one of my life goals, one of many. I really do, I think about it a lot. I really do want to open something like that. Let me just reposition. Oof. I'm having like really bad back pain at the moment. I think it's my scoliosis, but mobility is hard for me at this point in time. All right, next question. Robin says, wouldn't it be fun for you and Jean to go to Quebec? I would agree. It would be fun <laughs> to travel to Quebec. But I will say here is the problem with Quebec. Like it'd be fun to visit Quebec, but I don't ever talk about moving to Quebec or like a French part of Canada because if I move, if we move back to Canada, it's, it's largely going to be closer. It's largely going to be so that we can be closer to my family and stuff. But Quebec and Canada in general is just very far from other parts of the world that I would want to travel or live in. And what I mean by this is like, okay, right now I live in Paris, 
but I am a train ride away from Italy, from Spain, from Germany, from the Netherlands. Like I have easy access to all these places and I think that going back home and like living in Canada or Quebec, um, you know, you're sacrificing the accessibility you have to to travel, especially within Europe. And I would only, I think, make that sacrifice to be closer to my family and my community and my home and stuff. I'm, I'm saying I, but like, um, it's obviously like a joint decision between Jean and I. But yeah, why not? To visit Quebec, why not? I think Jean would love it. I think he would be very interested in that experience to see French Canada. All right, next question. Kareem says, thanks for taking the time to answer my questions in your previous podcast episode. Thank you, Kareem, for asking the questions. Honestly, you guys really do. This is what I'm saying. I love to hear from you because you make me think in different ways. You make me think about the opinions I have on certain things. You make me explore other topics. Like I just, guys, I love hearing from you all the time. Okay, Millie says, trying to figure out what school I want to attend in Paris. Girl, let me give you some advice. <laughs> so when I was deciding which school to do my master's at, there were several. Uh, at first I thought I would go the private school route because I guess I just thought, like I was coming from the North American perspective of like, okay, well, my undergrad cost me 60,000, whatever it cost me. So it's normal for a master's degree to cost the same. So I was ready to take out a second student loan and pay for this master's degree. Um, so initially I was looking at private schools, but the problem is if your goal with your master's, like my goal, my master's degree was to complete a program to be able to apply for citizenship and a working visa. And you can do that if you complete a master's program in France. But you can only do that if the school and the program is on like the accredited list from the government. And there were some private schools that I was looking at that were not on that list. So it would just be a sinkhole of money and I wouldn't even be able to benefit from the visa, like the working visa that you get after you graduate. So that's the first tip I have for you. And then the second tip is my experience in the public schooling system like because ultimately I did not take out another loan I went into the public school system which in total my master's degree cost me maximum 400 euros and I went to a journalism school in the south of France it was chef's kiss amazing I had a great time I learned a lot it really was a great experience and I'm just so thankful that I I made that choice and I didn't take out a loan and I just yeah, I can't even, I cannot even imagine because one of the master's programs I was looking at was like 15,000 euros a year. So 30,000 euros for the program. And can you, can you, like I saved that money and I still got a really good education. So those are my two tips, public school and make sure the program in the school you're going to is on the government accredited list so that you don't have any problems getting your visa afterwards. Okay, MCB says, love you both, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> and Alex, my brother, says, J'aime ta visage, ma petit singe. Tu me rappelles de mouche. So many, so many grammar errors, Alex. I'm not impressed. But basically he says, I love your face, my little monkey. You remind me of a fly. Wow. Always coming in with, with the important questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that is all for this week. I think that's everything. I mean, okay. Oh my gosh, I've been talking for so long. I really thought that today would be short and sweet. I didn't even have this much energy before I sat down, so this is kind of crazy. But I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Please, please don't be mean to me in the comments for giving my opinion. You guys, I really mean it when I was like so hurt some of the comments so please like i i'm a fragile soul <laughs> please um but yeah i hope you guys have a really good rest of your week let me know what you think especially about the itineraries down below and i won't see you on thursday i'm working on a video that's taking a little bit more time so it will be out on saturday so yeah see you this weekend <laughs> <laughs>